thank you for the introduction and uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, this is me and some of the organizations that I work with. I have no financial disclosures or other conflicts of interest to disclose. This is my website. You can please check it out. And uh, I want to do a land acknowledgement as well. I'm here on Indigenous territory. But to go further and acknowledge that myself and the society and economy that I'm part of, we're not just settlers, but we're also part of an aggressive and continued colonization of Indigenous people, the global poor, and of nature itself, both here in North America and around the world. And I'm first going to ask, in 2021-22, why are we logging these old growth forests with trees that are even over a thousand years of age and arresting over a thousand activists who are trying to defend them? Now, if you go back, um, there's this cool guy and plenty of others around that time that had lots of uh, cool sounding environmental ideas that didn't make any difference at all. Since then, things have gotten way worse. And we now have you know, more politicians at all levels, technocrats and these big conferences um, that for the most part, as far as I can see, don't make any systemic change. They make lots of platitudes um, and uh, you know minor measures that don't challenge the enormous consumption, the wealth and status of, of people who are basically running the show and have many conflicts of interests and uh, in, in terms of keeping their um, great um, consumption, wealth and relationships with industry. Oops, okay. Um, there we go, oops. And in the meantime, we can see that greenhouse gases get inexorably worse as do global temperatures. But I'm going to ask us to do one thing. Larry mentioned the climate crisis, but I believe we shouldn't be talking about the climate crisis. That's a sub problem of the real issue, which is biodiversity loss, ecosystem fragmentation, degradation, and global human injustice. And the problem is that when we talk about greenhouse gases um, or climate change, we find these solutions that can reduce greenhouse gases, but have an even greater or equal impact on the real problems that I've just mentioned. And we are in the sixth mass extinction period. Lots of research to show us this. Climate change is an important contributing factor, but we have to look at all the factors. We are degrading ecosystems, biomes, land, water, soil, degrading life for humans and life on earth. There's over a million species at risk of extinction. These are the main organizations below that track biodiversity. And every eco action that we have done so far has not bent the curve on this uh, ecological genocide that's occurring because we don't want, for the most part, to uh, address root causes and systemic solutions. So what are the root causes of biodiversity uh, loss and uh, degeneration? Let's start with people. Now, of course, people everywhere are beautiful. These are people I've worked with. When you look at world population, though, 1% growth doesn't sound like a lot to most people. But if you start with a baseline of 7 billion people, it means we add a billion people to the planet every 10 to 12 years. In November, we're going to have officially 8 billion people and 10 billion by 2050. And by the end of the century, it's estimated 9 to 12 billion people. Don't let anybody tell you that we're going to get a fixed number of people by the end of the century. There are many factors at play that we have to work on. And there's quite a range. This is demographic information from the United Nations itself, talking about the different possibilities. There's a slide here. This slide here should kind of rock your world. If you look at all mammals on land, on Earth, one third of the total biomass is made up by humans and two thirds by our livestock that we directly control, breed, and, uh, and utilize. Wild mammals, over four, sorry, over 5,000 species, make up only 4% of the biomass. Now, since this data you know, has been published, you know, the numbers are even more skewed. If you look back 10,000 years ago, wild uh, you know, biomass uh, was about seven times what it is right now of large animals. When you look at large animal biomass, those that are 100 pounds or more, 44 kilograms or more, they've decreased sevenfold. But the total biomass 
has increased enormously, basically made up of humans and our livestock. This has a tremendous impact on the planet. During my lifetime alone, I was born in 71, the human population has doubled and animal populations tracked by this organization have on average decreased by more than 50%. We are annihilating life on earth. At the same time, you can see these statistics here about massive poverty and inequality amongst humans. These are pre-COVID numbers and things are worse right now. Global hunger has been increasing since 2014. And um, in just in the last year or two, there's been more than 140 million people that, have, uh, that face um, severe hunger. Okay? In the meantime, the global rich are getting richer. Okay, you can see these global stats here about the 1% holding 50% of the wealth and the global 50%, bottom 50% of the world holding only 1%. And if we earn, this is 2012 data, if we earn $50,000 US per person in your family, you're part of the global 1%. And that probably includes most physicians and most of our friends being in the top the sort of 1% to 2% if you want to stretch it to a couple of percent. You know, At the same time, we've altered 75% of the land on Earth Three quarters of all fresh water are devoted to our uses. We have cut down more than half of the world's forests and trees. We've especially cut down way more than uh, half of the large trees in the world, which we specifically target. They're the most useful and profiter, profitable. Agriculture takes up 50% of non-frozen surface of the earth. And I call this ecological genocide. Okay, it's genocide. I don't like the word ecocide because it sounds like a soda pop that you can buy it. Starbucks or McDonald's, okay? And it literally is a genocide because we are actually wiping out entire genomes and genetic diversities of species and ecosystems themselves. It's caused by our radical consumption of everything, looking at our whole production and consumption cycle. And the material wealth is mostly extracted from the global poor and goes, and goes towards the global rich. And the impact is then distributed back the global poor, generally speaking, okay? And we have to look at the totality of our consumption. Greenhouse gases are one important factor, but not the only factor. We have to look at the totality of our materials, energy, land, um, animal agriculture, our urban design, the way we live, the way we build, our transportation systems, how we use water, the military, industrial complex, everything and understand that population and economics are multipliers of consumption of all of these things. I look at consumption like this. The totality of our consumption is the average of our consumption times the number of people. But we can break that down a lot further and in different ways. We can look at the aggregate consumption of every human being or individual products, groups of products, actions, systems, behaviors, and look at the sort of physical, energy, biological, human impact of all of these things in terms of the way we do a life cycle analysis. We have to look at things on scale when millions and billions of people consume something in the billions or trillions of units, millions, billions, trillions of units over time periods. We can look at them globally, regionally for subpopulations. A hypothetical example, if I was just thinking about it, we have about 1.5 billion vehicles on earth times four wheels and about 10 kilograms per tire. Now, these are conservative. The actual number is actually much bigger than this, but that amounts to 12 millions of tires that we would manufacture per year. And if you look at the raw material that you have to get upstream from this, the vast deforestation for rubber plantations, water pollution, extinctions, um, on all the different materials that go into the tire, and you look at downstream, there's 6 million tons of tire dust that go into the air, water, and land per year. Okay, and the global production and use of tires is growing, but tires are just one of the thousands of components that go into each and every car. Each and every one of those components has their own impact and one of millions of uh, things that we actually consume. Another quick example, if 4 billion people buy a pair of shoes per year, it's 0.6 kilograms on average per shoes. That's 2.4 million tons of product. But backwards calculate and think of all the extraction impacts and forward calculate all the impacts of the waste as all these shoes break down into all kinds of pieces going everywhere into the environment. Now think of the big things, houses, cars, buildings, roads, factories, infrastructure, concrete, okay, that we use and the massive upstream and downstream effects of all of these things consumed in the millions. And so let's 
then talk about the consumption of these things. Let's talk about our economy, all right? And possibility of green growth. So what is growth and what is the economy? So GDP is kind of a measure of our economic growth and it's the total market value of goods and service produced in a year in a country. But we're interested in the biophysical reality behind that number, okay? The materials, energy, labor that goes behind it in real life, the land, everything else, okay? And we see that greenhouse gas emissions and the material footprint is highly correlated with our GDP and the GDP incre increase, right? We can see from different uh, academic papers that it's not just uh, greenhouse gases, but multiple parameters that correlate with GDP that are impacting the environment. But wow, there's all these people talking about decoupling and two papers came out last year showing that, hey, there are countries that are decoupling their GDP growth from CO2 emissions. Fantastic, right? But oops. The problem is that they're only looking at one parameter. Again, I'm harping on this. It's not a climate crisis. It's a biodiversity crisis, okay? And human crisis. We are not looking at the totality of everything that we're consuming. So you might decouple your greenhouse gases a little bit, but you're not decoupling everything else, okay? And the papers themselves say that we're not decoupling fast enough to keep limits, you know, keep ourselves within two degrees. And the decoupling that we do if greenhouse gases is easily reversible, there are accounting issues as well. Now you can check these papers out that challenge the notion of decoupling, which is one of the biggest conflations that we face right now in the environmental movement, okay? Um, the basic problems with green growth, as I mentioned, uh, some of them, is you can't build renewables fast enough to limit warming. If we want alternative energy, it it's, will have a massive ecological footprint itself if we want to overconsume it at massive amounts. Rich nations are already hoarding key materials that are required for alternative energy, dominating them the way we do fossil fuels, and developing world will target our lifestyle, our, 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 the, the lifestyles of the rich countries anyways. So they are poised to also overconsume more and more. There are many other cognitive distortions and conflations aside from these notions of decoupling. I've listed some of them here, but we're not gonna go through all of them. One of the most imp important, however, is the conflations that are funded by industry itself, which are very powerful and sophisticated. Looking at Canada and our economic growth in relationship to it, we are driven and kind of hell bent on economic growth. We see it everywhere. We want to build everything because that is building our economy. And in the process, we're killing land and nature everywhere, everywhere, okay? Um, our massive, uh, we, need, we need to take a hard look at everything that we consume on multiple levels, individually and systemically. Canada, this is our growth since uh, the 1900. And we can see that we're uh, growing our energy and material input exponentially. This is since, uh, 1980, the economic growth uh, during successive governments, you can see it's a steady increase with little dips, but then overall, we will always continue to increase. And when you look at, this is greenhouse gas emission statistics um, uh, in a certain way, we can see that Canada amongst countries is a super consumer, pretty much on par with the United States in terms of how much we consume. And in terms of our materials and everything else we consume, uh, it's probably on the orders of, same orders of magnitude. Our population growth the last year is 1.8%, which is more than the global average, a 700,000 person increase in population. You can see our current population there. And we'll double, if we have a 2% growth, we double our population in 35 years. Um, StatsCan predicts at current growth levels, this is a StatsCan paper on this, that will be 57 million people by like 2068, 2070. And that's what drives our massive consumption and our massive economic growth as well. It's part and parcel of it. It's not the only factor, but it's a major factor. Our consumer of all things in terms of raw materials and land and water and everything else, and the massive products that we continuously produce, houses, cars, buildings, renovations, et cetera, in the millions and the smaller things in the billions. And I should also mention a big part of our economy uh, is an atrocity of our military industrial complex. Expansion and commodification of everything is everywhere. If you drive around and go around different places in Canada, 
uh, the, especially you know the pop, populated, semi-populated areas, you'll see massive road and highway expansions everywhere, paving over farms, forests, and um, you know outside of cities, just continuously expanding on all kinds of green spaces and heritage spaces within cities. And we have massive privatization of nature as well. Um, and the global, sort of the rich amongst us will have cottages and privatized nature more and more and expand those things, which cause infiltration of nature and disproportionate environmental impacts. And all of these things, every expansion is a permanent loss of nature, but there's so much money involved. You build a thousand units, that's one or two billion or more dollars worth of business. And we can see our GDP is very much hinged on this uh, um, manufacturing sort of construction. Uh, and uh, real estate development, et cetera. It's very hinged on that. And most of our finance is also linked to that, okay? And that's why we have this relentless consumption. No matter how many of these trees you cut down, it can never be enough. And it has these local consequences or, or consequences within Canada, but also worldwide consequences as we extract from all over the world to grow our consumption, and especially on people that are the global poor. Now, when we look at uh, the greatest impacts, it's that richest 5 to 10%, 400 to 800 million people that create most of the greenhouse gases and probably most of the other environmental impacts as well. Okay? And that includes most Canadians. That's most of us. Okay? Now, the benefit of our economic growth mostly goes to the richest 10% of Canadians. Okay? And again, that probably includes most of us and our friends. And these people who drive a lot of the decisions that happen in Canada as well. Um, but the consequences of this powerful growth, yes, there are big wins for the top 10%, but it affects our minds, our focus, the way we think, and stress and mental health too. And there's a lot of people who get left behind in our society, people who are poor. As everything grows, they get more marginalized. Same with people who are like artists or elderly, fixed income, and you know, indigenous people who choose to live a more simple lifestyle and not be part of a full uh, mainstream economy, okay? then they're going to be left behind more and more marginalized. We live in a high stress, no time kind of society that's increasingly like that because you have to keep competing to just even stay at your present level of, of wherever you are in society. And that, you know, our public institutions can't keep up in terms of we see our healthcare flooded and we get these eco anxieties, but no time to exercise, cook up for friends, et cetera. And it's not just Canada, there's sort of this geopolitical competition uh, that we see around resource acquisition. Now, what do we do? So I'm talking about the idea of environmental economics, ecological economics, and degrowth. Okay. Economics is the study and the management of our of our production, distribution, consumption of goods and services, okay? But environmental economics is sort of the nuts and bolts of conventional economics used for environmental and social targets. Ecological economics goes a step further and is more philosophical about this thing, taking a bigger picture view. Degrowth is an environmental con economics concept, eco-economics concept, where, we, where it's a planned solution by society to reduce our consumption of everything per person and in totality and have better consumption and reduce our population, according to me, although there's controversy, and uh, while increasing quality of life, health, equity, rights, et cetera, in Canada, around the world, and still keeping our society a, you know, a, a beautiful and interesting and, and vibrant place to live. Jason Hickel, amongst other authors, has a great book about degrowth, um, which I mostly agree with all the things that are in there, and a, and a beautiful definition. You can please, I'm, I know I'm going through a lot of slides, everyone, but please download my slides. They'll be available for everybody, and so too will all the references be attached to the slides. Okay. And I believe that, you know, population-wise, globally, you know, whether we're high, middle, or low income, all populations need to decrease. A lot of people blame population increase on the global poor, but that's not fair and it's not true. Um, and our consumption quality, the way we consume things must, of course, increase, uh, you know, have better forms of consumption, right? Um, but the global rich must massively decrease our total and our individual consumption, okay? You know, in the middle, you know, some people may uh, consume about the same um, or less or more. And the global poor, who are so poor, do you have to increase their consumption in a way that's strategic, that maximizes quality of life while minimizing impact? This has to be done. They have to consume more for a decency of life. 
And the different economic tools we can use for these goals include on the left column, the, the traditional or conventional economic tools that we are, are well aware of, and we should, we should know how to utilize them for these different types of goals that I mentioned before, including reducing consumption and increasing human well-being. Okay. Now, there are evidence of low consumption, amazing societies where people are very happy and healthy. The blue zones are one of my favorite, but there are many more. All right. And just imagine a life with less of the things in our left column, which people are very highly addicted to, you know, having big houses and more stuff and exclusivity and big fancy cars and all kinds of luxury, right? But actually trading that for having more time and community and cooking and, and all kinds of things that are really essential for our human well-being in these, in these brief lives that we live. And where do we start? Now, I think that as organizations um, and people, we want to start learning and discussing and promoting the concept of degrowth. We have to start thinking about this first and learning about it first and understanding the current problems in terms of our consumption and, and, uh, and, and possibility of cons consuming less and what that would look like. And before we can you know, reduce our consumption, we probably need to just level off our consumption because that in itself will have big economic consequences where we, which will require readjustment and maturation of our consumption or of our economy first. So um, there are lots of policies and examples in terms of how degrowth uh, can occur, okay? Um, tax reforms, negative income tax, you know, the concept of sort of public wealth and private modesty, all kinds of things here. And I have slides that sort of expand on all of these. So I'm hoping that people will invite me for more talks where we can get into it more. Okay. And, and, uh, and, and those are some of the things there. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip through this. It's a lot of words, but people can download later. Okay. Now, key points. There's a massive ecological genocide caused by radical overconsumption of everything. Okay. And we have to understand the totality of our consumption, not just a single parameter like greenhouse gas emissions, even though those are very important in and of themselves. We have to consider everything. The global rich will have to drastically reduce and share. Environmental organizations don't like talking about this because it ruffles people's feathers. But it's unfortunately the truth. We're going to have to do this. And I think that we should look at the evidence of our econ economics and how it, the totality of overconsumption has this impact to be able to better understand this. Population decrease is important. Again, I think we have to look at the evidence. There's lots of research around this. Degrowth and environmental economics are paramount. And if we don't focus on this and get this and sort of unite behind these ideas, all the individual projects that we do need to sort of unify around a central concept, I believe. Individual reduction is important but it's not going to work without systemic reduction, concurrent systemic reduction. And there is a way to be happier, healthier, and more just and equitable and have a great world for people in the process. Okay. And I think those are the main points that I have. Here are some of those uh, links to the organizations I work with. I hope people will check them out um, as well. And I have a longer presentation on YouTube from 2021. Um, although this one has some more uh, concepts in it. And um, my slides will be available with some resources and links where you can download some of the articles also that I've been mentioning. So I hope that uh, that concludes everything and we have a few minutes for questions.